Hello. Um, hi, everybody. So, um, as Alistair said, my name is Laura, and I am Head of Design in Monsoon Consulting. So today I'd like to talk about the complexity of B2B from a design and user experience perspective. Um, a lot of this, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the, the differences between B2B and B2C. And like, there's so much going on in the B2C world in terms of design. All of the innovative and really creative stuff is happening within that space. And also, there's a real focus on usability. But B2B then seems to get a little bit forgotten, as we can see with Mark's example of uh, his uh, online uh, internal portal. So B2B sites actually should emphasize usability more, not less, because they have to accomplish more advanced tasks and research more specialized products. So there are so many similarities between B2B and B2C, and that is the need for clear information architecture, um, compelling content, details about products and services that the users actually want to know about, and simple, usable websites. Um, but I suppose there's, 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 there's all the kind of same user experience principles that are on both sites, but the usability gap between the two is pretty big. And it is worth noting that the same person who is a B during working hours is actually a C in the evening. So these B2C sites are actually setting users' expectations really high. So the business-to-business -business, uh, websites and portals really need to kind of keep up with that. But there are obviously, as we all know, some key differences between B2B and B2C. And I'm going to talk you through some of these complexities and maybe offer some insights and some solutions as to how you may be able to overcome these. And the first one is the buyer's journey. And as we all know, I suppose typically the B2B journey will be a lot longer than that of a B2C customer. Um, a B2B customer is less impulsive. They involve a lot higher priced items and items that are not actually standalone. They involve lots of compatibility or regulatory compliance. So your website must support long purchase decisions. So your customer may start their research weeks or months in advance. They may actually talk to multiple people throughout their business uh, for approval, for justification, or for research purposes. And um, I suppose you need to support them along this journey all the way at various different stages. So I know that it's been brought up before, but a customer journey map is actually a really useful tool for you to really understand the phases that your customer goes through. And it's a visualization of a person's um, journey to accomplish a goal. So they can be as complex, or um, which is obviously this one's quite complex, or as uh, simple as you like. So a journey map is just basically a kind of compiling of a series of user actions on a timeline. And then you're plotting emotions and various different uh, key stages to create a narrative. So you have your specific user, which is going to be your actor. Um, and you would typically use one per journey map. Then you have the scenario, which is what the journey map is about. It's the situation that you want to um, uncover. And then you have a kind of fairly uh, high level phase overview. So this is the journey phases. So for, for instance, it could be like your onboarding stage, it could be your research phase, then the purchase, and then possibly your support. So they're the journey phases. And then you have, you plot the emotions and your, uh, or your customer emotions and their thoughts throughout this process. So you can start to kind of see opportunities then arising from these various stages. And you can start looking at different pain points throughout the journey and it's up to you then to start looking at opportunities to improve um, on this. So you can do various different ones for lots of different uh, customers. So here's an example of one uh, filled out, obviously very uh, person switching mobile plans. So you can see the definition stage, the comparing stage, <coughs> negotiation, and then select. So obviously you can see there that there's kind of various opportunities that may arise from your analysis of this journey. 
but where to start? And I know that obviously it can be quite overwhelming to start these kind of processes internally. So I've kind of stepped it out here about how you could even go about trying to start something like this. So first of all, it's the aspiration and what is the aspiration for this journey map? Um, and who do you want to document? And who do you want to understand more about? And then it's getting the right allies and the right people in the room to help you with this. And then internal investigation. So throughout your business, you probably have loads of different departments that have undergone different um, customer uh, surveys or they've done different research. So it's up to you to get your hands on this and bring it all together. And then with your allies, start making assumptions and start plotting out your customer journey map. But along the way now, it's really important that obviously you need to validate it. It's been brought up before with, with, uh, with Paul that talking to your customers and actually validating your assumptions will actually help consolidate a real solid customer journey map. And they're really beneficial for kind of two main reasons. I suppose the process of creating the map actually forces the conversation and alignment with your team and you're, you get a better understanding of your customer, which is always a benefit. And then you get to see opportunities for improvement and you can start to kind of, I suppose, uh, prioritize these um, as, 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 as you go along. Um, sorry, yeah, back actually, there's one more point. Yeah, so just on, on that as well, you may find within your journey map that you, know, you do see an opportunity for your early researcher that maybe you need to support them a little bit uh, more by giving them more information or down the line you may see that a product isn't actually giving the right information <coughs> to the questions that your customers have. So then another key difference um, between B2B and B2C is users and choosers. In the B2B um, environment the, the user may not always be the buyer where on B2C the buyer is all the user is always the buyer. Um, and an example of this may be that like an engineering uh, lead may come onto your portal or website. They're doing the initial research. They need to go to a mid-level manager then for approval. And then they need to go to a procurement team to, um, to purchase the product. So the users use the product and the choosers evaluate the product. And where a lot of B2B sites get it wrong is that they actually tailor all of their content to the chooser, who really only comes in at the very end of the process. And they uh, leave out the kind of user information and what the user really wants to know. But then, if you actually tailored all the content and information to your user, how would your product ever get bought? Or, yeah, so something that is valuable for a buyer or a user may not have benefit the other person. So it is very important to know that you need to tailor your content to both users. So speak to both of them. And your customer journey map will allow you to know when and where you should speak to them throughout the process. The user is looking to solve a problem with your product, so they want to know specifications, they want to know details about the products, the experience and what support is available. Whereas the chooser, they want to know the benefits. They're interested in cost, reliability, integration efforts, support, and evidence of return on investment. So it's important to note again as well that like users and choosers, they may not share the same problem, but they actually pursue the same goal. And another uh, big issue around B2B uh, is the resistance to change. So a lot of the time, the current uh, the buying process actually has widespread adoption throughout the business and it's ingrained in lots of different parts of the business. And resistance to change um, is quite, quite large because it's risky and it's, it's, it's problematic. So um, your B2B customers as well would have really specific user behavior around how they interact with your, uh, with your business and, and, and your purchase process. Um, a lot of the times your users will complain about things and they will complain about usability and they'll complain about this, that and the other, but when it, when it comes to actually changing or improving something, there's a real kickback. And you see it on any sort of like Gmail or a Facebook, whenever there's any small little change, there's uproar. Um, 
but how do you encourage behavior change and how do you you know I suppose you do need to change you need to move on how do you do it but it's called persuasive design and um, very clever guy called Fogg he came up with this uh, behavior model so he claims that for a behavior change to uh, to happen you need to have three things to co coincide together to actually make behavior change. Do your customers and your users have enough motivation to do what you're asking them to do? Do they have the ability and are the triggers and prompts in the right place at the right time? So you can see this is his behavior model. So um, when motivation is high, you can get people to do really hard things. And in that area there, your triggers and your prompts succeed here. But when motivation drops, people will really only do easy things. So when you come to look at making a change within your organization or your buying process, um, you need to, I suppose, look at what the motivation are, what's the ability, and then see where you can kind of put your triggers and prompts to drive change. So as well with, the, with triggers and prompts, um, starting with a very small prompt and then building up to like something that's a little bit harder. So it's kind of a chain of events, but um, it's, it's very useful when you're looking at, at doing something that is, I suppose, a bit resistant, uh, people are resistant. Um, it's worth noting as well, yeah, that, that give people repeated prompts when and where they have the ability and motivation to act. So um, when somebody does something once, they're more likely to repeat that behavior as they go on. So the website goals for a B2B uh, and a B2C are somewhat different. Um, and I suppose we, we really need to support the user along the way. And there's some kind of website goals that I've kind of pulled out here that would help reflect this. Um, and the first one is survive the screening process. So this is where SEO comes in, you know, can your customers find you? Um, secondly, when they come to your homepage, are they rejected due to not being able to find the information that they need? Um, and then when it comes to the content, is the content <coughs> answering that the, the questions that they have? And then next is support your users. So most of the time, you may have an expert or a manager within your customer or customer's organization that really are championing for your product or your service. Um, so it's up to you to um, help them uh, convince their peers and convince their bosses that you're, you're the right fit for them. And you need to give them the tools to do this. So giving them downloadable product images, white papers, product demos, um, you know, slideshows. So give them all the tools mm -hmm. that they need to advocate for you. And then build your reputation. So um, show from your website that you're easy to do business with. Um, you have certain support channels, like for instance, like online chat, after sales support, and really show that you're committed to developing customer relationships. Again, we see this again. <laughs> but um, all of what I've talked about is really underpinned by knowing your user and ultimately knowing how they think, how they act. And um, the only way that you're gonna do this is by kind of real customer research. So going on assumptions, going on opinions and um, unverified facts is like giving your team, it's like blindfolding your team, giving them a bat and hoping that they'll hit the pinata. Um, so you're, you may actually be solving problems that actually don't exist because you've just made an assumption about your user. Um, real, real data and real solid customer research is really where you need to go. And getting access to your users within a B2B space is actually a lot easier because more than likely you already have a relationship there with your customers and they, you know, they, they, they want, I suppose, to be involved in, in certain things as well, and they're more likely to participate. 
Um, so the research is really there for the taking and you'll never regret talking to your customers, you'll never regret getting customer research or doing usability tests because you'll always find insights. We've never done usability tests that we haven't found something interesting. Um, so it is worth it. So knowing your users will actually help you understand the pain points and will allow you to create value going forward for your customers. And the solutions that you will provide will be more meaningful and the customer service that you will offer will be a lot more successful. So that's me. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's quick. Any questions for Lauren? We've got time just for Yes. Uh, in terms of uh, monitoring the customer journey and that, is there any particular software tools that you use to know that as a, as a software mon uh, monitoring tool, like a hot shell or anything? Yeah, like you, it, would be, it would depend on the business. So it would really be and depend on the goal. Like a lot of the times it's like you have your data and you actually have kind of real qualitative information from talking to customers and I suppose the internal research that I'd kind of suggested that you do is that you would get your hands on possibly the analytics if there's hot jar get, getting your hands on all of that information and then compiling that into kind of an overall story so I suppose there's not one tool that you would use I suppose it, it does involve some sort of interpretation of what's there you know okay thank you Laura thank you very much thanks Thank you.